Good evening. Welcome to the Tuesday, March 23rd, 2021 school committee meeting. As always, these meetings are audio and video recorded. I call this meeting to order and we'll start with the introductions to my left. Natalie Barrow, student representative. Robert Mullen. Good evening, Mark Branco, assistant superintendent. Hi, Mike Flanagan, superintendent. Ryan McMahon. Becky Stanton. Good evening, Julie Guastucci. Anthony Tenorella. Jeff Bow. Joe Messina, business administrator. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I will seek a motion to approve the March 9th, 2021 school committee meeting minutes and the March 9th, 2021 executive session minutes not to be released at this time. I'll make that motion. I'll second that motion. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carry 6-0-0. Correspondence. Uh, Mr. Chair, we have two pieces of correspondence tonight. The first one I'll talk a little bit about later, Vaccine Hunter, uh, Vaccine Hunter Angels of Massachusetts and, uh, and the work they've done for us uh, over the past week or so. I'd like to move on to, to, to 3B if I can, talk about the tiered focus monitoring. Um, as you know, uh, historically, uh, the, the school districts in Massachusetts uh, are audited for all their federal and state laws and regulatory requirements pertaining to both special education and civil rights. It used to be called the Coordinated Program Review, which happened every six years. They've since updated the process. It's now called the Tier Focus Monitoring Review. And basically, they come in and look at everything you do as a program. They look at your facilities, they look at your policies, your procedures, your protocols, they interview staff, they interview parents, they interview myself, and they assess where you are deficient and where you need some support. And I'm pleased to say that I, Mrs. Lewinzik was here on January 12th briefly talking about this and providing an update that this was going on. So from January 25th to February 22nd, uh, DESE reviewed everything about our special education program and our civil rights program. And I'm very proud to say that last week we received, we received a report from the uh, department that found zero findings in special education. That's our 15th consecutive year of having no corrective action in special education. And that's an absolute testament to Mrs. Lewinzik, our special education facilitators, our teachers, our related service providers. Uh, they do a phenomenal job. Additionally, in terms of civil rights, because of our policies and our practices in the district, uh, we are in full compliance there as well with also no corrective action. That's a first for us. We usually have one or two things that we need to update, but because of the, the work of our policy committee and Dr. Branco and certainly the policy subcommittee to, uh, to make sure that we are tight, uh, we have zero corrective action there as well. So we're thrilled that, um, that we had such a great report. I will also add that in part of my exit interview uh, with the department, they asked for my permission um, to use our documents and protocols as exemplars for other districts in the state, and we did grant that to them. So I'm uh, very pleased with uh, the performance of our special education department uh, and all our teachers and everyone. So that's all good news. All set? That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Visitors, comments, and questions? I see none. Share the success. Natalie? At CES, they celebrated their return with the Spirit Week, Trivia Tuesday, Popsicle Parade, and a dance party send-off on Friday. The classroom teachers have used morning meeting to review their community rules, stripes, core values, and the importance of following mitigation strategies. Their K through four remote learners have successfully transitioned to their new teachers, and they are also proud of their efforts of the remote students. Mrs. Kavanaugh added that last week was filled with excitement, fun, and smiles, and that it's so great to see their hallways and classrooms filled with joy. A special thank you to the staff for making the return so special, and they're looking forward to finishing trimester three strong. At TMS, they're in the middle of a spirit week this week. Eighth graders and sixth grade were tied for the lead after the first day. Uh, look forward to neon on Wednesday, and with the weather warm and getting nicer, many classes have been held outside, and they're looking forward to getting their lunches outside to have some fresh, fresh air. The teachers continue to do great things with their kids in the classroom while the students continue to get more comfortable in the new in-person model. At THS, BioBuilder Club is preparing for their final assembly presentation, uh, which will take place Thursday after school virtually. Robotics is meeting twice a week to prepare for their competition later this spring. And their Easter egg hunt fundraiser is on April 1st and 2nd. And there are five awesome prizes and it's $5 to enter. 
With our first week of in-person learning, it could not have gone any better. The THS, THS staff greeted the students with uplifting music, a balloon arch, and super friendly smiles. Everyone was so happy to be together again. And the seniors just completed their cookie dough fundraiser and are looking forward to making their last class fundraiser on April 1st at Blaze Pizza a huge success. And lastly, our football team had a great victory over Hudson on Saturday, this past Saturday. Thank you. There are no subcommittee updates at this time. We have no personnel updates at this time. Unfinished business, Dr. Flanagan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll jump right into the slide deck. We'll go to the first slide and you'll see that as of 1216 this afternoon, we have six active cases in the district. Three at the elementary, one at the middle, and two at the high school. Go to the next slide. Last Thursday night, uh, I tweeted this out. We're very excited that it was the first time our community has been in the green for, uh, on the mass DPH metric. First time we've been in the green categorization since September 2nd. Um, so that was great. And, and, the, and the trend, and, and, and Chair McMahon, you always talk about the trend over the number of weeks. Um, so the trend's going in the right direction. So I, I know your COVID staff review team, you talk about this all the time. I think one of the things that we're hearing we're a little concerned about right now is that that green may be going back to yellow this week. So again, I, I would implore and plead to the community that we do everything we can to, to keep ourselves safe and protect the, the, the learning model that we have here at the high school. So happy to be in the green. I'm hoping that we can, uh, we can stay there or, or move there if we're not there on this Thursday. So Vaccine Hunters Chapter of Massachusetts, uh, I want to tell a little bit about this. Um, we have, March 11th, everyone who works in the K-12 school system became eligible for the vaccine. So we put a, a survey out to our staff uh, on March 15th, and we had about two, we had 231 responses out of about 270 staff. Uh, of those responses, 83%, 83% said that they have been vaccinated, already have an appointment for a vaccination, or are not interested at this time. 17% of our staff were requesting support and help securing vaccination appointments. Um, it's a process. It's, it, was, it was difficult for, for some people to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and try to do the CVS thing. Um, so I received an email from, the, from this gentleman, Tom Bent, who works for this, va or not works, volunteers for the Vaccine Hunters of Massachusetts. And basically, it is a goodwill pay it forward group of uh, group of people and individuals who uh, wanted to support educators and do everything they could to help them get vaccine appointments to get them back in the classroom and feeling safe. Uh, I'm thrilled to say that within two days, the Vaccine Hunters of Massachusetts secured 48 appointments for TPS staff that wanted it, and we actually expanded up to our Whitson's cafeteria staff as well as all of our D bus drivers. So anyone associated or affiliated with Tinsborough Public Schools that wanted a vaccine, the vaccine hunters in two days were able to secure 48 appointments. So uh, thank you to Tom Bent, thank you to that organization. I know that each one of our schools a blasted out a thank you on Facebook, put a message up there. So um, really, really pleased with that. So we'll jump right into the reopening update. Just to start with a couple statistics, um, you can see where the bus ridership is at this point. We have 435 students at the elementary school riding the bus or 70%, 398 students at the middle school or 53% riding the bus. In terms of learning models, in-person students at the elementary school, 625, in-person at the middle school, 353, and in-person at the high school, 385. Um, so just, I want to pro provide some statistics. I think, you know, what we're starting to see now, we're starting to see trends and, and, and more parents requesting uh, that students come back to school in person. So, uh, so it's going in the right direction. I think, I think early indications are that next year it, it will be fully in person. Um, remote potentially will not be an option next year. Um, but that's still to be determined at the uh, commissioner's level. Um, just a couple comments in terms of reopening. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm on the wrong one. Okay, let me go to this. We'll, we'll talk about this now, then I'll do my comments after. Did I skip those? No, I, I messed up. <laughs> so, um, so reopening, uh, bus, con bus, close, bus close contact diagram. Um, there's been a lot of talk about close contacts. Um, and, and one of the things that we know is Though DESI and CDC are saying three feet is acceptable for distancing in schools, they're still saying if someone is positive, it is six feet to be determined to close contact. So what we've done is we've worked with DBUS to develop what a close contact diagram would look like on our buses. Now you'll see at this diagram right here, it shows three seats on each side. You can sit 
three students per seat at the elementary school. You can't do that at the middle school or high school. So in terms of developing a master code and master diagram for this, we had to put three seats on each side. But if you look at this diagram and you, and you see student in seat 12A test positive in the yellow, you can see all the students in green who will be determined to be a close contact because they're six feet away from that one student. And again, that's mouth to mouth, six feet away. That's how it's measured, determination. Um, so one of the things that we want to bring attention to parents on, if you are able to drive your child to school, it may prove beneficial for you. Our kids have assigned seats. We have a buff buffer in the red up front for the driver so that the driver's protected and not six feet within, within six feet of any student. Um, but there is, there is a chance on a bus that from the ride to school, from school, you're going you're gonna to be near that person for 15 minutes. So if that student does test positive, you would be considered a close contact and have to quarantine and test to get back into school. You know, I think that's one of the things that um, we needed to show to parents and families that this is, this is a, a real possibility, which is why we've been encouraging driving as much as possible just as another mitigation strategy. If you go to the next slide, Dr. Branco. In terms of close contact, I know there's, there's been uh, some discussion out there. Certainly the bus is one place where we could run into that. We could also potentially run into two students playing closely together on the playground. We do the very best we can at the elementary school to keep them separated. But they're six and seven and eight years old. And there are a lot more of them than there are adults. So they do the very best they can. Um, so playground, recess, mass breaks, hallway travel, there is a possibility that cumulatively within a day, you might be near somebody within six feet for 15 minutes. It's, it's a very real possibility. The only way we can guarantee that doesn't happen is by going back to hybrid mode. Because you know in our classrooms, we set them up six by six in the hybrid model, and some of our elementary classrooms are six by six, but at the middle school and the high school right now, and some elementary classes, we're six by four. So if Ryan and I, it's actually not Ryan, because we'd be six in this direction all the time, but if the student in front of me tested positive and I'm four feet behind them, I'm a close contact. It's, it's, it's part of the risk of bringing kids back in person. Um, so I know that I was on a, a call today uh, with uh, my superintendent association, and there was a lot of talk about this. And a lot of talk about this because a lot of schools haven't gone back fully in person yet. And, and we can speak authentically that, yeah, we're seeing, we're seeing more close contacts uh, now than we did before. And part of it is by the six, because of the six by four, because there are more kids in the school. Additionally, we're also seeing an uptick in kids who are determined close contacts because of youth sports, organizations, and clubs that they belong to, play dates, weekends, get together, sleepovers are starting to happen. So it's happening outside of school as well. So the best thing we can do is encourage families and parents to please do everything you can to mitigate risk, try to keep our kids six feet away from each other. But it's a very real possibility being back in person. I think one of the things that we, we may benefit from moving forward is um, you know, unlike other districts that are going to come back three by three, I think we'll see proportionally that our close contacts will be, will be smaller in number than, than some of these other districts. But, but again, we're back now, we're feeling it now, um, and I think other districts are going to eventually get there and feel it a little bit as well. Um, so again, we're going to come back to the, to the community working together, do everything we can to, to keep these kids as safe as possible. Uh, and, I, and I just hope that you know, the CDC recognizes that it's okay to have be three feet apart in class. I really hope that they adopt the position that a close contact will be three feet or closer for 15 minutes. Um, Cause six by four is where our classrooms are and our kids will be fine at that point. So um, does anyone have any questions about the bus diagram and or the close contact while we're on this topic? Um, could you just speak about the quarantine re regime after they're determined a close contact? Do you have that? So, so I defer to Michelle Riley on that because she oh, makes yeah. the call. Right. Uh, I believe it's I believe it's up to ten days. It's yeah. up, to 10, up to ten days yeah. of quarantine. Yes, is that right? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's 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 one of the risks of being back in person. Right. Yeah. It's ten days or a negative test after a certain amount of time. I think it's right. up to five or seven days yeah. something like that. Yeah. And then they get, they can go remote during right. that time now. The, yes, yeah. they, yes, they absolutely can go remote in that time. Okay. And then, so that's a great. Point. Thank you. Yep. So if you're in the elementary school and you're in a classroom, you're not going to a remote teacher. You're staying with your classroom teacher, okay. and that cl classroom teacher will teach concurrently. Mm. Oh, okay. So we're not reassigning your class. Okay. Good. Dr. Flanagan, I have a question. Yes. Um, 
it's my understanding that while we might have had an uptick in close contacts, we have not identified any in-school transmission as a result of these, though. Is that correct? 100% correct. Okay. We have not seen any in-school transmission as a result of this. Dr. Flanagan, um, just looking at the model for the buses, are there ballpark percentage of our buses that are actually at a capacity where this is really what we're seeing? And then are there any of the bus routes that have fewer students that are on them that the routes could be altered in some way to reduce the number of contacts? So I can get that information for you. I, I can't speak intelligently to it right now. I know that, you know, um, certainly we're looking at 70% ridership at the elementary school. So the buses are minimally two kids per seat for at least half the bus. Uh, I know that wasn't the case when we were hybrid. I know we had buses that had some less than 12 kids on them. Uh, but I think certainly now that we're back full in person, it's a little bit higher. I would say that the, the Norris Road runs are a little bit better shape because the, the, the just less ridership. It's about 50% of the kids. Uh, but I can certainly get that information for you. Thank you. Yep. Any other comments around close contact or we're good there? So again, we're hoping the CDC comes down to three feet. If we can be three feet uh, per deci rules in the, in, the, in the classroom, we should be able to get three feet as close contact on the buses. Um, I asked each principal just to give me a couple bullet points about uh, their experience so far with reopening. Um, to a person, they've all thanked their custodial staff, their tech team uh, for, for doing a great job and getting the physical plant ready to go. Um, one of the programs here that Mrs. Kavanaugh talked about is we do have 12 high school seniors who are working uh, generally, I think from 11 o'clock to, to 3 o'clock in elementary school, and they're covering lunch duty and recess and, and classroom assistance. Uh, that's a program that was established by the Commissioner of Education this year uh, as a one year opportunity for kids um, to, to earn a couple bucks and get uh, high school uh, credit while working at their own elementary school and supporting those kids. So that's a great program. So we took advantage of that. We have a dozen kids down there for that. In terms of the middle school, um, I think that, you know, they're, they're, we heard about March Madness and, and Spirit Week, and, and they're, they're all doing a lot of fun activities and trying to make it as normal as possible for the kids. Um, I think Chris's favorite thing is his last quote. He, he was so excited to hear that the, the sound of learning happening again in the, in the classrooms, in the hallways, and just, I think we heard that from every principal uh, that we've talked to in the past week, that, hey, it, it feels like real school. Uh, it, it's loud, it's loud, it's crowded, and it's just, is more action. And I think they're all thrilled that that's the case. Uh, in terms of the high school, uh, they're, they're, doing their, they're doing a great job of mitigation strategies. Uh, and they're, they're looking at really, again, talking about some of those traditions. Mr. Ogden wants to have a homecoming. Ms. Kavanaugh wants to have a field day. Mr. Paul is planning March Madness, April Madness. They're doing everything they can to make the celebrations that are traditional, that are, that are, that are cultural parts of the school uh, happen for our kids. So. They're doing a great job with that as well. So everyone seems to be excited to be back. Uh, it's really great to see uh, more action uh, on campus. So any questions about that before we go to the budget? I just have a question. Yeah. You had mentioned some of our uh, traditions at each of the different schools. Do you think maybe in one of our future meetings we can talk about some of those traditions a little more and uh, what we're doing? I, I know social emotional has been a big focus for us this year. and those traditions help uh, with the social emotional aspect it would be great to hear a little bit more about how we're gonna do those traditions sure we actually um we actually just tasked the administrative team to come up with what their end of the year celebrations are going to look like and what the all, all the um all the activities are going to look like uh, over the next couple of months so um we can have that for the april 13th meeting that'd be great we'll have an update you. across the district all right so we'll go into uh initial budget presentation we'll go to the first slide so you saw the slide last week um, and this was, uh, Ms. Messina spoke to this, we're rolling over the budget next year. We're looking at a $492,000 increase if we roll over uh, all the existing positions and players, our 2.75% increase. Next slide. One of the big things that was TBD last week was staffing. We, we had a lot of conversations over the past week and a half um, to really talk about what that's gonna look like. You can see our contracted services went up our other expenses went up by some $513,000. So we're looking at, you know, almost a million dollars at this point. So one of the things that we had at that time, we didn't really understand or really didn't identify exactly what we we're gonna do for ESSER II funding. And we also didn't know exactly where we we're gonna land with staffing. So over the past week and a half, we've met extensively and we've determined that if we look at the number of retirements we have, if we streamline our operations to the best of our ability, if we make us 
as efficient as possible, we can go into next year by increasing our full-time equivalency by 0.1 position. So if we had somebody who was half-time or 0.8 that went full-time, that would be a 0.2 differential. So if we looked at all the moving parts, at the end of the day, it came out to an FTE increase of 0.1 positions, and it was a net savings of $56,000. So that brought our request from 513 down to some 457,000. Go to the next slide, please. So that being said, the staffing, contract service, other expenses, 457 plus the original 492 roll over the current staff, less about $159,000, which is left from that 228,000 of ESSER 2 money that came in, we're looking at about a $790,000 increase to move to next year's budget. And Joe's going to go a little bit deeper on the budget sheets as we pull out this time, Dr. Branco. As Dr. Branco pulls up uh, your two-page budget sheets, one of, the, one of the challenges the superintendent gave to me was to get that $790,000 increase into the budget two-pager. Um, it gets to be a monumental challenge when you have literally some two to 300 line items going up and down in some spots. So I basically just asked the superintendent if we could pull up the two-page expense and revenue budget uh, that shows for FY22. Um, the expense page in front of you just briefly summarizes the salaries at the top and then goes through each of the budget centers for expenses, um, marking all the way down to the bottom. Um, you can see the school committee budget request of $21,967,147. That is actually not $790,000 difference, but some $788,000 difference from this year's budget. And uh, the, next, the next page of this are the revenues outside of the school committee budget, the various grants and revolving accounts. We keep the school committee budget from the town at a level figure at this purpose for version one of the budget. And it comes down to that net increase at the bottom of the $788,000 increase. So we're actually a little bit better than the 790,000 once all of the multitude of expensive revenue accounts get tweaked. Um, I don't know, the budget committee has been working very much in depth with a lot of the expense and revenue lines in our meetings. Um, I don't know if anybody from the budget committee wants to speak to any of this or if anybody else has any questions about any of the other line items or revenues um, on your budget. And I guess I would just say right now, this is first pass. This is version 1.0. Uh, as you know, this is we need to land on an initial budget request at some point and then we go from there. Um, we are we have not met uh, with Town Administrator Hansen yet. Um, I spoke with him last Friday. Uh, we are going to talk later this week, I believe, and set up a date sometime next week that Mr. Messina and I will take a field trip over to Town Hall and kind of lay things out. Additionally, we're waiting to see where the funding comes in from the American Rescue Plan, um, you know, see what additional funding will come to uh, both the school department and or town uh, to really see what the number is going to be. Um, but, Mark, if you can go back to the slide deck. I think you know one of the things that we'll look at you know just from a 30,000 foot view is you'll see the TPS staffing trend there oh yeah I'll keep going sorry mm -hmm. uh, yeah TPS staffing trend you know, I know the people have said well the enrollment's gone down yes enrollment has gone down yep it absolutely has and, and so is our staffing footprint. The past five years, we've decreased 21 positions in the public school department. So we believe that as all, and I think one of the things that we strive to do is present a conservative and fiscally responsible budget. So right now we're asking for a 0.1 FTE increase to go from 242.6 to 242.7 next year. And the current request you can see at 3.7 percent. Certainly that's higher than historically we've, we've received in the past. But we always start higher. We tell you what our needs are and we work. We're still waiting on to determine what the final revenues will be. Uh, we anticipate additional revenue coming in based on the American Rescue Plan 
and from there we'll, we'll, we'll have a better sense of what the number is going to be. But at the first pass, we're looking at a 3.7% increase of $788,000. Any questions for Mr. Messina? Of course. Mr. Messina. <laughs> so with COVID, we know a lot of families went to either homeschool or private schools. And we're expecting a number of those families to come back now that we're full in person. How does the Chapter 70 money get calculated? It's based on the enrollment as of October, is that correct? October 1st. So, we have a number of families who were not in the district on October 1st. We expect to come back. So will there be a shortfall in Chapter 70 money that we need to overcome? I haven't heard anything. I don't know if the superintendent has heard anything on his level. Yeah. Um, I mean, those students aren't homeschooled. They're remote. So they're still being counted. No, but there was homeschooled we, we students. Did, we went up by like 17 students for yeah. homeschooled students. Yeah. And not to count the kids who went to private schools who may be coming back. Um, so I, I would make a global statement on that. I would say that there was significant discussion about this issue at the state level. Um, one of the things that it doesn't necessarily impact Tingsboro as much as some of the bigger urban areas is the Student Opportunity Act, which they're just bringing back for the funding for, is tied specifically to student enrollment. And I think some of the inner cities uh, have seen a lot of uh, significant decline in enrollment and are saying, wait a minute, that's going to drastically or dramatically impact our Student Opportunity Act funding. Um, so I know there's a lot of conversations playing um, out about October 1st enrollment. There's a request to look at October 2019 enrollment and use that as a baseline as not October this past 20. So, um, so there is conversation about it. There's been no determination made yet, um, but it's certainly playing out at that level. So people are cognizant of it. Okay. And I think with Sims, I mean, it's, you know, in the, in the old days prior to Sims, there was always just a one count in October. SIMS is a rolling information system that DESE could at any point say, we're not going to use October 1st SIMS information, we're going to use April 1st or May 1st SIMS information system. Um, I don't think they're going to look to be punitive towards any school district going through this. Um, and once the, the rescue money comes to the town, they may alter the formula a little bit differently just to ensure that there's no uh, punishment for school districts that may be going through something like this. Okay. So more information to come. Thank you. Go. Any other questions for Ms. Messina? All right. Thank you. All right. So Mr. Chill, going to uh, HC, TMS Middle School Building Project. Um, Boy, it's been a busy month on the school building committee side of things. Um, we've had a, a lot of meetings and, and a lot of conversations and a lot of great dialogue and discussion. So I thought we'd take this opportunity tonight just to kind of update the, the, the school committee and the community as to where we are in terms of the middle school building project. Um, right now, we are at ending, hopefully next week, um, the preliminary design proposal or module three of the process. Basically, the goal of module three is to and the feasibility phase, feasibility study phase of this project. So what we have to do as a building committee is come up with three or four potential options for the architects to fully design and come back to us with a schematic review. This phase also has to be approved by the MSBA. So there's been a great deal of work that's gone into this from the educational program that Dr. Branco took the lead on in writing this 40-page document with Mr. Pollitt talking about the academic educational programs of the middle school um, to space summary overviews, really looking at every square inch that's eligible to be built by the MSBA uh, and is potentially reimbursable. But at the end of the day, we as a district and a community must come up with at least three options. One is a code up upgrade option. So essentially, take the school as is, take the footprint as is, and make it up to code, soup to nuts, without increasing or adding anything to it. The second option, you need to come up with one addition renovation. How can we do something off of the middle school and add new to it? And the third one is brand new construction standalone that does not touch the middle school. Um, so this process has been playing out, and we ended up, from the beginning of this pro process, coming up with eight locations. 
and we got it down to three. So let me show you what the locations were. So this is the code upgrade option. Essentially, there is no difference here. You can see our service road in green around the back, our bus loop in orange, a parent drop off in blue. Nothing changes on this campus. That's the code upgrade option. This is one option that must be explored. So let's end that part of the conversation and move to the addition renovation. So addition renovation, designed by JCJ Architects, our architects out of uh, Connecticut. The first option they came up with was to keep the uh, existing footprint of the main part of the school, get rid of the catwalk, get rid of central office, and build an addition off to the side that you can see here with a brand new service road and green around back. That was the first addition renovation option. We'll go to the second one. The second addition renovation option, and this is addition reno because they, you can see in this one, the red, they keep the gym and central office. They get rid of the main corridor classroom part of the school and they add an addition out to the softball field. And they, you can see the orange in back is where they would potentially relocate central office. So that's the second addition renovation option. And you can see also in there, the yellow connection to the high school, covered connection, secure connection. And we'll go to the next one. That was it. Those two are the only two options we have for addition renovation. So now we talk new construction. And the first conversation we had was, could we go new construction at TES? Could we build a middle school essentially on the two fields over there next to the tennis courts? So the two game fields that are next to the tennis courts, one would be the school, one would be a parking lot. Well, this didn't necessarily work for a lot of reasons. Um, if we were to go in this option right here, um, we wouldn't be reimbursed for demolition of the middle school. Um, and as this committee knows, programmatically, we share staff, we share busings, we would have a significant operational cost every year. So this one um, did not get selected. <clears throat> right? So the next option was new construction behind the high school. So if you go out the back, straight down the hall to the baseball field and the, and the softball field out there, build a new middle school out there. And you can see the orange bus loop would come between the two schools, drop kids off uh, and pick up right there, the main access road. And we have the green service road going around the back. That was one option for new construction. Next one. Another option for new construction was in the parking lot out front where the teachers and students park right here where you're all parked tonight build a middle school there. Again, it would have the same kind of bus route down the middle, the orange line down the middle, a new service road around the back in green, and parent drop off would be in blue. Again, the orange block would be the district uh, offices. And then the last option for new construction was demo central office, gym, and middle school and build on the softball field with a connection right there. Um, so in conversations and where we landed as a committee, go to the next slide, sorry, Mark. The committee unanimously, not unanimously, but strongly, a lot of strong support came up with three options. One, the code upgrade, code upgrade. Two, the addition renovation was to keep central office in the gym and put addition back on the softball field. And the third option was to build a new school, demo the entire middle school and central office and gym and build a new middle school on the softball field. The thinking behind this, and we're, you know, we're following the leads of architects and designers and, and project managers. Um, you know, every other construction site was, was disruptive to the learning environment, um, but the softball field is a prime place to be developed. Um, and we have to understand that this could be a, a two-year project. So, so basically what we have right now are three potential options, code upgrade, addition renovation, and new, and these will be submitted to the MSBA for approval in the next week or so, we won't hear for another month whether it's approved or not. Once it's approved by the MSBA, then it's another eight to 10 months of design by JCJ Architects to come up with uh, what the schematic design will look like and, and actually look at the budget costs. And I think that's one of the things that'll, that'll continue to happen along the way, it'll evolve. We'll have, co we'll have conversations about um, you know, design and finishes and things like that. We understand that you know, we do not want, um, we're not looking for a school that's gonna be a magazine. We want a school that's gonna be a nice school, that's gonna be functional, it's gonna provide every, everything our kids need, but we're not looking for somebody to win a design award, uh, you know, with glass and mahogany and things like that. That's not, that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for a nice school that, that can grow 
and age and advance as instruction and, uh, changes. So uh, those are the three options that we came up with at this time. Do I have one more slide? I think I have one more slide. Yeah. So that's what we have, folks. So we're, we're this, this slide was from February 11th. So you can actually see on Module 3, we're actually more close to the end of Module 3. Uh, and then we have the schematic design, which will be all in the architect. And then I'll come back. It'll come back to the community for a vote at town meeting in May 2022. Um, do we support putting this ballot question out there? And then there'll be another vote in June. Do we support funding for a new school? So um, it's an exciting time. We got the first three modules just about done. And then it'll be, it'll be really exciting to see what the, what the um, schematic design can look like. We've been in a lot of meetings this past month where you see uh, prototype classrooms and what they've done in other schools. And it, it, gets, it gets you excited about the opportunities and possibilities for our kids and for our community. So, uh, so it, it's been a lot of work, but it, it, it's good work and it, it's, it's valuable work. And I think, uh, you know, we'll, we'll know a little bit more in the next couple months here. Anyone in the committee want to add to anything I just said? I just want to add um, the pictures that were, or the schematic proposals that we saw, those were just rough estimates. So the yellow blocks that we saw, right. Right. It doesn't mean the buildings are going to be shaped exactly like that. It's a best estimate based off of, you know, the years of experience that our architects have. So um, it may not look exactly like that if we ever get to the point of building, um, but it's a best estimate. Right. Great point. And a quick question along the lines: Does the, um, the MSBA choose which um, design? What if it's a code upgrade or addition, renovation, or new construction, or do we end up? No, the town will. The town so, the, so the MSBA will say, okay, you can go forward with your three projects here. We approve those. Okay. But it's up to the community to vote that. The community. Okay. And, and to Becky's point, you know, it's a great point. JCJ designed those in isolation. They designed those without community input. So there's going to be more opportunities for community input in terms of what's going to look like, potentially have conversations like, well, we don't need that to be that big. We need to shrink this. We need to have this. So that's all coming down the pike. Mm -hmm. um, but this is kind of where we landed on the first pass. Um, if I can, Mr. Chair, I'd also like to... Um, we, we as a committee have had a lot of meetings, but in the background, Dr. Branco, um, Dominic Simonelli, the fire chief, the police fire chief, chief yeah. the town administrators, um, this is a town project. So there's been so much time spent on putting these together. And uh, I'd just like to thank all of you for everything you did on top of trying to keep our town going and our schools going so thank that's, you that's a great point i was part of i was part of safety meeting with both chief russell and chief howe and to hear their perspective on what they would like to see in terms of sight lines in terms of access um that certainly uh carried a significant amount of weight in our committee um, we just we couldn't vote for some of them because our chiefs weren't comfortable with them and and that's that's it was all it was it was a town effort so thanks for recognizing that so, I, have a question. Um, I was Venture to say we're probably not going to go with the code upgrade, so we can ignore that. Um, the other two options involve taking over the softball field. Mm -hmm. Is there a plan to put that somewhere else on the site? So that would be part of the conversation, if that's what the community wants. And I think if you look at the, the parking lot that juts out in the end, uh, one of the designs that we've seen from JCJ in the past has that as, as a softball field. Okay. Thank you. And those, those are the conversations that need to happen. You know, they need to understand, you know, we, does, does a track become part of this? Does a softball field become part of this? They need to understand our community and have our community input. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to also mention that it depends what's reimbursable through all these projects, too. Right. Because some of those items may not be reimbursable as part of this project, so do we want to do it as part of this project? Right. I, I don't know how much use that field gets, but if it's getting used and we take it, yeah, right. We have to consider that, that's all. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that we, we also you know, learned through the process that you know, we are eligible for 54% reimbursement of what is reimbursable. The entire project is not reimbursable. That's the key. So uh, you know, if, if people say what you say was going to be 54% of what is reimbursable. So as we get through this, that's when our architects will say, this is reimbursable, this is not reimbursable. This, you know, so we can't hang on that one number and think the, the, the total tag is coming down by that much. So. And, and to that point, some of the educational planning, we were on a two-hour meeting this morning, literally discussing current programming and the potential for future programming, and something, the nuance of the language of whether you call something a utility space or a multi-performance space versus naming it for one particular subject, that nuance makes it reimbursable suddenly. 
-hmm. So that's why we're putting so much time and effort into the prep work around our educational language so that we can justify every single space in the plan. Um, and we'll be able to point back to the, to the rationale for the taxpayers and the community to say, this is why it's labeled this way, this is why it's built this way. Mm -hmm. And that's why when also looking at the elementary school as an option because of the land there, if it was built on another site, the demolition of the existing middle school gym and central offices would not be included. Um, but if it's built on the site on the softball field or in the parking lot, it would be. Yeah. And I think that price tag was over three million dollars. Yes, I recall from our meeting, mm -hmm. just just to demolish or raise the middle school. So. And that doesn't include asbestos removal or any other special things. So. so it's exciting. That's that's uh, where we are with the MSBA process. <coughs> Dr. Branco. Good. So in your drive and also in hard copy, you have a one-page program overview um, that I just want to speak to very quickly. We've heard about this, um, um, for lack of a more formal term, a kind of COVID. Oh, thank you. <laughs> kind of a COVID slide, so to speak, that we're very, very concerned locally, statewide, and nationally about the impact um, that the pandemic has had on all students, whether they're struggling learners, advanced learners, and everybody in between. This belief that potentially many, many, many students aren't where they could have been had this not hit. So it's strong encouragement um, from the state level and the federal level to really look at increasing summer programming in districts that already have it and to add summer programming. Um, where they do not. Um, so I've worked very hard with some wonderful people. The admin team at all three buildings have worked hard on this. The content leaders have partnered up on this, and we've had tons of meetings, fast and furious, over the past two weeks to try to get to this point in time. Um, so in essence, we're looking to put together two types of summer programming this summer, an intervention program and an enrichment program. Um, so the intervention program, as you'll see, will target specific students, grades, incoming grades 1 through 12, that the teaching teams believe really could benefit from a four-week jump start program in the summer. Um, and on top of that, we'd like to do some enrichment program in grades 1 through 12 uh, to give kids some extended learning opportunities connected to curriculum um, that would be uh, really beneficial to them over the summer. So th this is uh, our first pass at it. I'm also pr proud to tell you that we've had lots of conversations with Alphabest, who we stayed in, con in contract with this year through all of this. They are putting together a program called Alpha Quest, which is really nice looking summer program for elementary school. So we're going to partner with them and have them, you can see that in the fourth box down, a third box down, have them take over the enrichment under this umbrella for us at the elementary level and we will run our own enrichment program 6 to 12. The benefit to that is they provide wraparound opportunities that we really can't provide. So they have early drop off, they have late pickup, um, they can do half day and full day programming. So if some of our kids need to go into our version of intervention and the parents need to drop them off early, they can do the alphabet early drop off, they can do our intervention, then they could get signed up for a second half day of enrichment. So that's uh, kind of a robust program that we would not have been off able to offer. So I'm happy to have those conversations with them and we're getting moving. Um, as early as tomorrow, this whole thing will get blasted out to the faculty and staff, hope to put a posting out and start to get a real understanding of interest. Um, and, and figure out how we're going to staff this. And then my, my um, aggressive timeline is the week before April vacation to send notification information out to families um, to let them know um, that their ch child might be recommended for the intervention piece and to also let everybody know about the enrichment programs. So that's where we are, um, looking at all kinds of other options and funding. Uh, we think we're going to get some federal money potentially for this that we can use. Um, Dr. Flang had forwarded a grant opportunity a couple days ago from the DESC. So between the federal money, the potential for a state grant, um, we think we're going to be able to pull this off. So if we just step to the next slide. Um, so just to keep on your radar, um, we do have a, we're going to go back 20 years <laughs> and have an April 12, 2001 Tri-Board meeting. Sorry about the Tri-Board <laughs> <laughs> So Monday, April 12th, we'll have a Tri-Board meeting at 6 p.m. at Town Hall. Um, that's with our legislators. April 13th is our next scheduled school committee meeting. Um, at that point, we'll talk about reaffirming Warren Audit because we will have a superintendent of subcommittee meeting that night. Um, in conversation with Mr. Messina, we did some little backward design on the calendar. We believe that we're going to need to have another school committee meeting. Um, it, it's going to be contingent upon when we sit with the town administrator, and it's also going to be contingent upon when we know what our revenues are going to be. 
Um, so I would just ask everyone to kind of keep that in mind, whether we go, uh, you know, four days before, um, uh, excuse me, a week before, uh, April 13th on April 6th, or we go April 20th or 27th. At some point, we're going to need to have one final meeting to really come back and talk about, you know, our initial pass is 788. What's our final number going to be, our final request, and what that percentage is going to be? But until we get more information, we can't schedule that just yet. Uh, we will have a regular scheduled meeting on the 13th. Maybe we can do it that night. I don't know where we're going to be, though, in the process. Um, that being said, another thing that I did not put on here, because I just received the email. I received an email from our, our attorney um, that wants to begin negotiations uh, at some point. So that is now coming up on the radar, so I don't know if we want to. So before we move on to that, yep. the, if we need to have a meeting prior to our next scheduled meeting, we would need to vote on tonight to give you the authority to call that outside of this meeting. Is that correct? Yes. Probably yes, let's do that. Okay. Yep. So I'll make a motion to um, give Dr. Flanagan the authority to call um, another meeting prior to our April 13th meeting. Second. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It carries 6 0 0. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, negotiations is the only thing that's out there. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Sorry, I just want to make sure. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. All right. Did I cut you off? Did you want to keep talking? Or? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Done. To, to Mike's point, uh, the teachers union is looking to begin negotiations sooner than later. Um, currently, Mike Moran is on the negotiations subcommittee. We know he's not running for re-election, so he would be available to begin negotiations. He won't be around to end them. So I think it makes sense to replace Mike on the subcommittee at this point. So we have continuity through the negotiation process. Um, so anybody wants to volunteer, somebody wants to recommend somebody. I'd like to nominate Julie for that, if Julie's okay. willing. Okay. Anybody else? Any interest? Seek a motion to nominate Julie. I'll make that motion. Second I'll it. second it. <laughs> Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We carry 6 zero, zero. Welcome to the subcommittee. Thank you. All right. Finance, Mr. Messina. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, 14 bill warrants were presented to the school committee tonight. I do have them all back and approved. Uh, in the drive is the list of warrant numbers, accounts, and amounts. Uh, for signing of payroll, uh, nothing at this time. We'll, we'll do that again at our next meeting. And in your drive are the three reports that make up your February 21 financial packet. That is your school committee budget, your revolving account balances, as well as the student account balances. And I will leave the March enrollment to the chair. Thank you. At the elementary school, we have 753 students. The middle school has 394. High school has 444 students. There are 22 out of district students for a total of 1,613 students. All right, anything further? That is it, thank you. Thank you. We'll move to the school committee discussion. Natalie? How long has that been? Surprisingly, I have nothing to see. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good, thank you. Um, just a quick Thank you to Dr. Flanagan uh, for giving, going through with myself and Becky on the, another round of tours through all three of the schools um, over the last couple of days and, and just getting an opportunity to see all the shared spaces, the gyms that are being utilized as classrooms. Um, just It's incredible to see what every one of the schools is pulling off right now. And you know, I think the weather's been helping cooperating for lunches and things like that. But it's, it's an amazing amount of effort and work that has to go into making sure we're able to get the kids in the classrooms, keep them in the classrooms, um, and, and really seeing how, to, how it's had a positive <coughs> effect on the students and, and the teachers, too. You could feel the energy in every one of the buildings. Um, one of the things that I was happy to see is that um, even looking at the younger elementary school grades, lower elementary school grades, even right through the high school, you didn't see a single mask issue. It was never, I saw one that was dropped below a nose or off or too much physical contact or, or, or no social distancing. It was really 
very that students were good about it. They you could tell that they were reminding each other and checking on each other. There was one point where you actually saw a student that would use their crutches, put their arms out, and yep, we're good, <laughs> and, and and came back. So, you know, it's. I think everyone's just so happy to be back that they're being exceptionally careful, um, and it's it's just it was really great to see. Um, got to go through the nurse's office and see what's going on from a perspective of how are you handling COVID related issues, potential issues, um, and just your regular playground scrapes, bruises, headaches, I need a break from class. Um, and, and really seeing that it's, it's working quite well. Um, I think having um, the additional nurse on staff is absolutely making a, a huge impact. It's allowing all the nursing staff to have a little bit of a breather, not that they're not busy by any stretch of the imagination, um, but being able to really dig into what they need to and be able to handle the full load of, of the students. So it was really, really great to see all that. Um, and just where we were in the green last week, and even though there is potential, we might be in the yellow, just hoping to see that we continue to do as well as we have. and. Um, you know, parents continue to just make the right choices out of school so we can keep the kids in school. Before we move on, Tony, I apologize. I looked at Jeff. I skipped over you, Joe. Did, did you have anything? No, you sensed I had nothing left to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to give you the opportunity. Last <laughs> meeting, I skipped over Jeff, so it's fine. It's right. the problem with this one. <laughs> Tony? Um, I just want to say I had the uh, ability to be here last Monday. Um, when the kids came back for the opening, um, I watched the bus routes. I watched the kids get off the buses. Um, we started at the high school. They had the balloons. They had music playing. Um, the teachers were excited. The staff was excited. They were all standing on the balcony screaming as the kids were coming through. The kids were excited. Um, the admin team was, some of them were outside. Mr. Pollock at the middle school, opened every car door, welcomed every kid by name, um, thanked the parents for bringing them. It was just, it, it was exciting. Um, we didn't have the traffic issues that I honestly thought we were going to have as a result of the number of kids coming through, so that was good. Every kid to a T had a mask on, got off the bus with it on, walked through the hallways with it on. Um, I'm excited they're all back, and I could tell they're excited they're back, so. Good job by everybody who, who made this happen, so thank you. Um, I, I had the opportunity to go to a football game. It was <laughs> awesome. <laughs> the one on Saturday, and it was just amazing um, to um, see how they all pulled it off, and there's a lot of social distancing happening and masks and um, not too many people, but enough to make it feel like a good football game. It was really nice to see. And we won, too, so it was a real positive. <laughs> Uh, similar to Jeff and Tony, um, I had the opportunity to walk through the three different schools over the last few days, and um, I, I want to reiterate what they were both saying about masks. Everybody was so good about it, and I was looking, I was really looking for people to not be good about it. The high schoolers were great about it, um, and that's where I thought we might, you know, find something if they didn't um, see us watching, but they were all great. Um, the social distancing was great. The crutches were kind of funny. Mm -hmm. um, one of the comments that I heard um, an elementary student say is that they were really excited to see their friends that they hadn't seen in a year. They hadn't been in class with these kids in a year. Um, and that was really like pretty uh, heavy statement for uh, an elementary student to say. Uh, and it was just great to have them back. Um, Something else I wanted to share because we don't, the community may not see some of these things, but some of the things that are going on in the background to try to make sure that we're continuing to up our game about um, airflow in the classrooms, now that the weather is starting to get nicer, uh, wherever possible, and especially at the middle school, the custodial staff has installed box fans to blow the air out those windows. And so uh, there's good air circulation going on in those buildings. I've never seen that middle school looking so good. And every time I go, it looks uh, better. It's still the old middle school. 
but um, mm -hmm. it's better and better every time. So um, thanks to um, Mr. Simitelli's team for that, because I know that's quite the feat. Um, and then to personally speak about drop-offs, I've, I've had the pleasure of personally doing the elementary school drop-off and the middle school drop-off, and they move. There's a lot of cars going through there, but they move. So for anybody who may be considering um, doing the drop-off that might be, not be doing drop-off now, uh, it moves pretty fast. You really don't spend that much time in the drop-off line. Uh, it's efficient, it's safe, mm -hmm. uh, and it goes really well. So that was all I had to share. Excellent. Yep. So I'll just say uh, just briefly that I think last week was truly like the first week of school. I think by Friday, our teachers, our students, administrators were exhausted. Mm. And it was nice. It was great. Um, I want to thank our teachers who are doing a phenomenal job. They've been flexible all year. They've been adaptable all year. Um, and they're prioritizing kids. And I think the energy in, in the schools, uh, in all three schools the past week was phenomenal. Phenomenal. So, so happy to have the kids back. Uh, looking forward to what comes next over the next couple months. Excellent. I have not had the opportunity to visit the schools yet. Uh, next Friday, Mike. Yep. We'll be visiting all the schools, so I'm looking forward to it. Um, I know my kids are super happy. Uh, a little over a week into it, uh, they're excited. They, you know, they get to sit with their friends now. You know, they're getting outside. They're having lunch with their friends that they haven't seen. Mm -hmm. you know, in school, like you said, in a year. So mm -hmm. it's, it, it feels like school again. So it's, it's very nice. Um, we do not have a need for executive session tonight. So I will see the motion to adjourn. I'll make that motion. I'll second it. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carry 6 zero, zero. We are adjourned. Have a good night, everybody.